Welcome to Conversations with a Calvinist. This podcast is dedicated to helping believers better understand Scripture, defend truth, and engage culture. Get your Bible ready and prepare to engage today's topic. Here's your host, Pastor Keith Foskey. Welcome back to Conversations with a Calvinist. My name is Keith Foskey, and I am a Calvinist. And I'm joined today again, uh, thankfully, by my good friend and not yet Calvinist, (laughs) Matthew Henson. Matthew, how are you doing today? I am great, and I'll have you know, I took one of those uh, Are You an Arminian or a Calvinist quizzes this week, and uh, the numbers have not shifted, unfortunately. I still tested negative for Calvinism. I'm sorry. You you know, I took, I just, I was taking a sip of coffee in hopes that Uh you would Uh say, (laughs) that you would say that you were, and then I could spit it out and be like, oh, Uh yes, but I didn't. So I didn't. Uh I was prepared. Oh, no. (laughs) I'm sorry to disappoint you, Keith. Maybe someday I'll get it straightened out. Well, I am. I I will say this. I enjoy our fellowship. I enjoy our conversations as always. And today we're going to be talking about a subject that is, um, I think, near and dear to both of our hearts. And that is um, the subject of the passing of a man named John Shelby Spong. Now, the reason why I say it's near and dear to our hearts is because Spong uh, has been a longtime rival of the theology that we would espouse, the theology that he would have probably identified as fundamentalism, uh, but we would simply call biblical Christianity. And um, But Spong was a man who certainly made his mark on the Christian world, albeit uh, we would consider it probably to be a very negative mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Spong made a lot of influence, and I had the opportunity to meet him several years ago, and he passed 10 days ago. Today, we're doing this recording on September 22nd. He passed on September the 12th, 2021. And I thought it would be good for you and I to talk about him, to talk about the influence that he had, especially in the Episcopal Church. As many people know, the Episcopal Church has for a long time uh, been moving in a very liberal direction or has moved in a very liberal direction. And to give you an idea of what type of people the church is endorsing and the type of teaching that the church is endorsing, it's uh, John Shelby Spong provides sort of a snapshot of that. So uh, as we begin, I just want to I want to read from the Washington Post. This is their obituary for uh, John Shelby Spong, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it is rather lengthy. But I want to read the first couple paragraphs and key in on a few specific points. So. It begins by saying, and this is written by Harrison Smith on September 14th, 2021, the right Reverend John Shelby Spong, a liberal theologian and retired bishop who shook up the modern Episcopal Church, championing the inclusion of women and LGBTQ people in the clergy while promoting a non-literal interpretation of scripture, died September 12th at his home in Richmond. He was 90. The Episcopal Diocese of Virginia, where Bishop Spong had preached early in his ministry, confirmed his death but did not give a specific cause. Friends said his health had declined after he was hospitalized for a stroke in 2016. And this might be why we haven't really heard much of him in the last few years. The last I remember of John Spong Uh, John Shelby Spong was that when I got to see him in the debate with Dr. White, and that's been, uh, I think, uh, 08, somewhere around in there. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'll get back to that in a minute. But that's that's the last I um, had heard. Uh, It goes on to say Bishop Spong was an outspoken leader of the church's liberal wing known for his efforts to open the faith to marginalized groups and preach a message of love and justice that would resonate in an increasingly secular age. Interesting use of language there, justice and love and key key words in, in, in modern liberal theology that that's the focus. And we know that it's not what we would call biblical justice, but again, we'll get to that in a little while. Goes on to say he acquired an international profile while writing more than two dozen books appearing on TV shows such as Oprah and Larry King Live and serving as Bishop of Newark, where he was the spiritual leader of some 40,000 Northern New Jersey Episcopalians from 1979 to the year 2000. I mean, just to think of the massive and broad reaching scope of his 
thoughts and ideas, 12 mm -hmm. books and um, a ministry that spanned uh, 31 years and reached over 40,000 people. And um, later on, when we begin to really look at what he taught, it's amazing that people who identify themselves as Christians would look to this man as a leader in their community. Um, that th This is really what we're going to talk about today. Um, and like I said, I wanted to mention the fact that I have met Dr. Spong. It was only one time, but I wanted to share a little bit about that. Uh, when I was, when I was early, <clears throat> excuse me, early in my ministry, I was, uh, very influenced by the teachings of Dr. James White. Many people know that I've talked about that on my program. He's still a friend today, and I appreciate all that he does with Alpha and Omega Ministries. Well, Dr. White had a debate with John Shelby Spong here in Florida, and I had an opportunity to go to that debate. It was actually a, a wonderful time. I got an opportunity to sit and talk to Dr. White for a little while. It was like a, getting to sit with one of my heroes, my first time meeting him. So that was really the focus of my trip was my time with Dr. White. But so I didn't know anything about John Shelby Spong. All I knew was that in the debate, he was supporting the LGBTQ plus position, which at that time, I don't even know what the letters were, but they were, you know, probably just LGBT or whatever. But he was he was supporting the idea that the Bible supports homosexuality. And I was looking forward to a robust debate. In fact, uh, Matthew, you had a debate at your church on the same subject where you guys mm -hmm. invited Dr. White. Uh, we did. Mm -hmm. what, what did you, off the subject for a second, but what did you think of the debate you guys had at your church? Did you feel like it was a, a good debate? Because I, I went, I was there that night. What were mm -hmm. your thoughts? I mean, do you, I know, I know I didn't prepare you for that question. So that's okay. That's all right. So I was moderating that debate. So I'm not allowed to have thoughts on it. Oh, oh, yes. No, 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 <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. So I can, I can have thoughts about it afterwards. And I had some during it, but my job was to be neutral. Um, and I hope I, I did so. Well, but anyway, um, it was between Dr. Uh, Dr. White and Dr. Brown, actually. It was a two-on-two -two debate, um, and those two, um, not that Dr. Brown cannot handle Greek and not that Dr. White cannot handle Hebrew, but they had their counterpart, um, Dr. Brown being a Messianic Jew and Dr. White being a, a Greek professor, sort of working both the Old and New Testament, the one voice of Scripture. <clears throat> and the important thing is the thesis of that debate, excuse me one second, the thesis of that debate was, is homosexuality consistent with New Testament obedience? And so that puts squarely the burden of, of proof onto a handling of the New Testament. And that was only really done by, I'll say, two and a half of the debaters. Uh, Dr. White, Dr. Brown certainly did. Uh, the, the gentleman, um, whose name escapes me right now. I'm sorry. Um, uh, there was a, a lady and a, a gentleman on the other side, uh, it was Reverend Ruth was her name. I don't remember his name. I'm sorry. Anyway, he did attempt to engage with some of the scriptural passages. He went to Romans one, he went to first Corinthians six and tried to, you know, play around a little bit, pulled out a concordance, pulled out a, a, a lexicon and tried to, you know, play a little bit with that was in my opinion, soundly defeated, but attempted to. Um, but the majority and, and for Reverend Ruth's part and the rest of his part, it was just love. It was just saying the word love over and over and over again and not specifically nailing down anything. So do I think the debate went well? Honestly, not really, but to be honest with you on the liberal Christianity, the LGBT supporting side of Christianity, that's about what you get nowadays. Um, that yeah. was a very good picture of a little dabbling maybe with the new Testament to try and assuage some of your more, uh, uh, I'll say rigid thinkers. And then the rest is just emotionalism. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I was just looking up while you were talking, Dr. White's debate is in, with, with John Shelby Spong, uh, was in 2006. So oh, that wow, gives okay. you an idea, November 8th, 2006, at least it's what it's, co what's coming up here on Alpha and Omega website. And it's the title of it was, is homosexuality compatible with Christianity? And then a sub question, mm -hmm. is it unloving and judgmental to believe that God has spoken on homosexuality? That's the, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the sub question of the debate. And, and, and I go ahead. That, well, that thesis is quite, is important because it says, is it compatible with Christianity? Yeah, the thesis that we picked or was negotiated for the debate at our church was very specifically worded to ground the authority source in the New Testament. 
Yeah. I've watched that debate to what you're referring to, and I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, but I don't know that Spong even touched the New Testament other than to say it's a useless old book. That's and that's the point I was getting around to is sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, you and I are uh, we're we're the two sides of a of, of a coin. You're you, you know I'm the Calvinist mm-hmm. side and you're the wrong side of the. Coin. Oh <laughs> come on now, come on, there it is. Uh, okay, so uh, someday I'll, someday I'll get it right, Keith. Yeah, uh, well uh, we'll see. Well, the, the, uh-huh. the Lord the Lord is always gracious. <laughs> yes, there we go. Every, all day, every day. Yeah. So, um, but but looking at it from the, the perspective of the two debates, at least as mm-hmm. you said in the debate that I went to at your church, there was sort of an attempt to deal with mm-hmm. the text. Um, Spong just seems to throw the text out of hand a priori. Just the, 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 we don't need to worry about this. This is not mm-hmm. you know who cares what two thousand years ago Jews and uh, you know uh, Jewish Christians or Jewish thinkers had to you know who were writing the New Testament. Who cares? You know, the, mm-hmm. and that's sort yeah. of the attitude. Um, and, and again, I'm, it's been a while since I actually listened to the debate. Again, I was there, but, uh, you know, going back and listening to it, you know, I, 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 maybe somebody could correct me and go and say, well, they did talk about this or they did talk about that. And mm-hmm. I'm sure he cited some passages that would use the word love. As you said, that's the one, mm-hmm. you know, that they would always want to cite. Or uh, as recently I posted something on, on YouTube, it was something that I, I had preached <clears throat> and taught. And somebody posted a comment, you know, let him who is without sin cast a first stone, you know, John, John eight. So it's, yeah. Oh yeah. So it's always, you know, you can't say anything. You can't make Mm -hmm. a judgment because, you know, Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. And that's the only verse that that's the verse that people know more than John three 16 is just about Matthew chapter seven. Yeah. So, so um, this is who, who Spong was. He was a person who took great issue with the Bible, took great issue mm-hmm. with uh, the what we would say is biblical Christianity, very foundational things, the personality of God, the deity of Christ, the, uh, you know, all of these things that, 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 are, that are central to what we believe mm-hmm. as Christians. And in a moment, we're going to be looking at uh, 12 points of teaching that Dr. Spong or uh, Reverend Spong, I, I don't even know what uh, I could call him. Whatever, John Shelby. I'm sure Spong, he got an honorary at some point yeah, from somewhere. Yeah. So, twelve points of doctrine that he presented, which were called actually twelve points of reform, uh, and he w- it published in the Voice, which was a newsletter of the Diocese of Newark in 1998. So, this has been around mm-hmm. for for uh, over 20 years. But before right. we do that, you and I before the program we talked about another thing that is important, and this did come up. As you mentioned, back during the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there was mm-hmm. a lot yeah. of questions as to whether or not we we should be celebrating the death of someone who is in opposition to the the uh, the Bible, celebrating the mm-hmm. death of like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, a person who supported uh, abortion, a person who mm-hmm. was a a, 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 a a an advocate for the murder of babies. And I did mm-hmm. a program on that when she died. Mm-hmm. I did a, a, a short, uh, I, that was back when I was doing the daily program. So um, I did talk about this, but you had some thoughts on that, that you wanted to mm-hmm. share. And I wanted to let you do that before we get into the theology of John Spong. Sure. Sure. So this is, this is a very pastoral concern for me. And, and I mean that just sort of as an adverb, not as an office, because I'm not a pastor at our church. But um, <clears throat> in, our, in our weekly connect group, we talk about current events sometimes and how ought the Christian respond. And um, there comes a question sometimes when a very famous person, and, and, and Justice Ginsburg was one such person, um, there is this knee-jerk outpouring almost from even portions of what we would consider conservative Christianity to go out of our way to say nice things. Well, she was amazing. Well, she was great. Well, she was an advocate for, you know, this and that and the other, and we need to mourn her passing and all that. And that never sat right, nor did the grave dancers and mockers and scoffers and laughers and all that kind of thing. And so I had some thoughts on this, um, how, how ought the Christian to respond when someone like this dies? So if you, if you have a saint in your church um, who, is, who loves the Lord, who is proclaiming the gospel, who is biblically sound, and the Lord calls him or her home, then there is mourning, but there is also a celebration that the work is completed for this person, 
and, and, you know, there's a complicated set of emotions, but how do we respond if someone who is, I, I will say opposed to the gospel and, and Romans lays out that there's really only two categories. You either opposed or, or you are of Christ. So here's, here's laying all that out. Here's kind of what I was thinking. If someone in my connect group said, okay, knowing who Spong was and what he was about, should we be happy about him dying? If that's the question, here's what I would, here's how I would answer. So our starting at the very top, starting with God, our greatest desire should be for the, the demonstration of God's glory in all things. Um, the foremost way he has done so is in the incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. That was the, the greatest demonstration of God's glory was him revealing himself in that way. One of the effects of that is the salvation of humanity, not all humanity, but the salvation of humanity and the reconciliation of creation. Colossians tells us about this. That is step three in this. Now, a lot of people start with the greatest demonstration of God's glory is the salvation of humanity. I, I want to be clear that that is definitely a thing that demonstrates God's glory, but we need to sort of back up a little bit and, and make this very God-centered. Yes. So with that being said, if something is preventing the salvation of, of humanity, if something is preve preventing or restraining the, the spread of the gospel, and God in his grace and in his sovereignty chooses to remove that thing, then Christians should celebrate that removal. Mm. If, it is, if the government says it is illegal for you to um, you know, pass out Bibles and proclaim the gospel, and then the government decides, actually, no, that is legal, Christians should celebrate. The gospel now has avenues to, to move forward. Or that, um, government, or that government is overthrown by a better government that yes, does allow yes. that, then, then we could celebrate that. Yeah. Then we should celebrate that. Absolutely. The gospel moves forward, and, um, and the gospel won't be stopped no matter the schemes of man. But anyway, if God chooses in his grace and in his goodness to remove an obstacle to the gospel, we should celebrate. And so from that perspective, if someone or something is leading people astray, if there is a wolf among the sheep and the shepherd in his goodness decides to strike that wolf and remove it from the flock, then we should celebrate and be glad that he has done so. Now, balancing that thought out, the loss of any human apart from Christ we believe results in the perishing of that sinner and a separation from God, a casting out and um, any, an eternity of punishment. Sure. I would say, that, I would say it's, I, 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 the term separation from God, I was understood. I, I almost bit my the, tongue as I said it's it. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Separation from his, uh, from his grace. Either yes, there, that's, that's but, the but way in the it. presence of his wrath. But go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No, th no, thank you for the correction because I, I that's how that's how I was raised actually is saw is okay, well, sinners are separated from God. And it, it wasn't only until about a year ago that I think it's Revelation 13 where it says that the wrath of the Lamb is there yeah. and they are in the presence of the Lamb. And I'm like, well, yeah. that just rewired a yeah. whole bunch of theology, you know? Yeah. Like, so I, I'm a recent ar arrival to, to knowing that that's what the Bible says. So you're absolutely correct. Um, so if a person is, is, dies in a state of sin, if, as Jesus said in John 8, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Mm, yeah. And if someone does die in their sins, um, the Christian should grieve. I think Spurgeon said, we don't know who is elect and who is not, um, but we ought be clinging to their feet and cling, I'm paraphrasing, clinging to their ankles with tears in our eyes, begging them to, to turn. Um, until their very last moment. And, um, and if in the end they choose my way instead of God's way, then that is a, a source of tremendous sadness for the Christian. And so I guess wrapping all that up, that's a complicated way of saying Christians should, should rejoice that a deceiver um, and a, an enemy of the gospel, and we'll get into why that is in just a minute in case the listener thinks that's too strong of a claim, mm. uh, has been, we should rejoice that that has been removed. Um, but we need grieve the fact that this man, as far as we can tell, um, died without knowing Christ truly. And, um, you know, perhaps God worked in his heart. We don't know until the very last moment. Um, that's up for him to decide. But as far as we can tell, uh, we, we, we grieve that. Yes. And, and I, 
absolutely. And very well spoken. Um, it, you know, you, you, you mentioned, we don't know the condition of his heart. Certainly, um, he heard the gospel, had to have heard the gospel. I know he heard the gospel the night of that debate. I know that yep. he's heard the gospel probably from people trying to reach out to him on many occasions throughout his life as they heard him essentially putting the gospel under his feet and, and, mm-hmm. and, and burying it mm-hmm. into the ground uh, as he stomped upon it. So it's mm-hmm. it, certainly he heard it and we don't know what happened in the last moments of his life. But, but one thing that we, we, we could say, at least I know no, I have seen no evidence of a recanting. I see no evidence of any change of heart and what yeah. we're, what we're about to read with his points of reform for Christianity is evidence of an unregenerate heart. Uh, yeah. So at, at least in the, 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 the majority of his adult life and teaching, he demonstrated an unregenerate heart. And so, yes. as you said, we don't know what happened in the last days or moments of his life. And we can only hope that uh, there was some grace there um, that mm-hmm. perhaps uh, led him to repentance. Uh, I, I, I tell you, there's a, there's a, and one day I may do a show on this. There's a list mm-hmm. Uh, floating around the internet of the last words of many unbelievers who died, atheists who die. You know, right. I'd give I'd give anything for another day. Uh, there's just a lot of things that are said in the throes of the, the you know the death pains. Yeah, and, and it's and it's famous atheists people who who are known. <laughs> and I just I, I've thought about talking through that because thinking about what 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 goes through someone's mind when they know their last breath is coming very soon. And we don't right. know what, we certainly don't know the mind of John Shelby Spong uh, in, mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in the last days of his life. But if he held to a consistent position mm-hmm. up, up to his death, then, then this is the position that he took. And that's what's going to transition to the 12 points of reform. Now, I do want to mention to our listener, if you're interested in reading these, because we're going to go through these kind of quickly, if we, if we spent um, five minutes on each of these would be another hour. So we're there's 12 points here. So some of them we're just going to read, make a few quick comments and move to the mm-hmm. next one. But uh, if you want to look at these, uh, feel free to just, just Google John Shelby Spong, uh, spelled just like it sounds, S-H-E-L-B-Y, uh, Spong, S-P-O-N-G. And uh, pull up his Wikipedia page. It tells about where he was, where he served as uh, the um, the uh, bishop uh, of uh, of Newark. It talks about his time there. Talks about his early life and career, his writings, and his death. Um, but these are the points of reform, and these are also listed on the Wikipedia page. So this this is from him. This is not something we're we're not attributing anything to him that he would not have affirmed himself. We're not saying correct. Some, we're not putting words in his mouth. These are his mm-hmm. words. And interestingly enough, this was written, as I said earlier, in The Voice, which is the newsletter of the Diocese of Newark. So this mm-hmm. was not something that was in a personal correspondence to a friend or something that he published in the New York Times. No, this was in a uh, a document that went out to the uh, leaders of the Episcopal Church in Newark. And these are the 12 points of reform. And uh, he elaborates them on in his elaborates on them in his book, A New Christianity for a New World. Number one, theism as a way of defining God is dead. So most theological God talk is today meaningless. A new way to speak of God must be found. <clears throat> as you said earlier, Matthew, uh, I don't remember if it was before the show that, that he really didn't believe in a personal God. Mm hmm. And we see that yeah. here, the idea of theism. What is the difference between theism and deism? Can you explain that real quickly? Because people, go ahead. Sure, sure. So, but even before we get into this, if the listener has heard the discussion we had on modernism versus postmodernism, yeah. Um, we one of the things we talked about with postmodernism is that it is so amorphous and so difficult to understand a. Uh, a, a realm of thinking that does not have any absolutes or anything like that. And actually, you asked me on the show, can you give us a good example of postmodernism? And I struggled to do that. Um, it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. Well, to the listener, I am pleased to report that John Shelby Spong has managed to nail jello to the wall. <laughs> and we're all about to marvel at the jello that has been nailed to the wall. Um, if, and by the way, if you hear me speak in disdaining terms about this, I am, dis- I am disdainful of this of the the ideas and the texts that we are reading 
um, the, the prior bits about Spong's, the fate of his soul and all that, and the grief that I feel is real. Um, but I will absolutely um, be uh, merciless to his work because it is truly uh, rough. So uh, theism as a way of defining God is dead. Well, theism is uh, theism versus deism. Deism is simply the, I'll say, the acknowledgement of some sort of higher power. Um, it's it's an idea that um, very sort of came about very much in the Enlightenment, though it was very popular back in in ancient Greek philosophy. Um, it acknowledged that there it acknowledges that there is some higher power, but what that power is and what that power is up to, we really don't know. Theism, T H E I S M, is that this higher power. Um, there may be more in theism, there can be just in that word, there can be more than one, but, but the higher powers, if you will, are definable, describable, and in some way understandable, not entirely, but in some way understandable. Um, Spong just threw theism completely, completely away. Um, yeah. it just, there it is. It's dead. And I think too, there's, a, I would only add one thought and that's theism tends to be personal where deism tends to be impersonal, the, the, Correct. whatever the, whatever yep. the power is and theism, it's something that is able to be connected with and, and discussed with, and even, even, uh, negotiated with where the, the deism it's, it's simply a power or an energy or a force, almost like something that we see in star Wars, you know, the, idea right. of this, yeah, the, this, this use force. the force, trust in the force, that yeah. kind of idea. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So uh, basically, as you said, he is de he is denying a personal God mm -hmm. and, and, and in the very first thing. So you say, well, how does such a man become the Bishop of Newark? Well, don't don't we know just recently there was an atheist who became the uh, the chaplain at Harvard mm -hmm. or was it Princeton? Was it Harvard or Princeton? Uh, no, it was Harvard. And um, I regret to inform you, and I'm 80 percent sure of this. I regret to inform you that whoever is running Tim Keller's Twitter account um, said, congratulations. Can't wait to see what you do in this position. Yeah. Oh no, I saw it. I saw it. And I almost, I've already, I already did one show on Tim Keller's. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to, I, I don't want it to seem like I'm, I got a ax to grind with him, but yeah, I almost, sure. almost did a show on that as well, because it is here. We have an atheist who's a chaplain. We have a man here who doesn't believe in a God, uh, a personal God. He's the Bishop of Newark. And we wonder why Christianity is the way it is today. Right. It's because we've abandoned the foundations of the faith in many places. All right. Number right. two, number two, since God can no longer be conceived in theistic terms. And again, that's, he's assuming one to make the it's second assertion. Point. Yep. <laughs> since God can no longer be conceived in theistic terms, it becomes nonsensical, nonsensical to seek to understand Jesus as the incarnation of the theistic deity. So the Christian, the Christology of the ages is bankrupt. Okay, there's no personal God, therefore, that Jesus is not the incarnation of that personal God. Yep. So there you go. We don't believe in personal God. We don't believe in the deity of Christ. He's two for yeah. two. <laughs> so I think the far. apostles, the and I, you could say this at any point, but the apostles would be quite surprised to learn about any of this, uh, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and he would say they were all uh, products of ignorant 2,000-year-old uh, mm -hmm. worldview, and, and certainly they would have an issue with him, but he doesn't care. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't care. Basically, probably. Number three, the biblical story of the perfect and finished creation from which human beings fell into sin is pre-Darwinian mythology and post-Darwinian nonsense. Oh, boy. Hmm. So... Yeah, <laughs> we, we both are thinking of the sermon that we would give in response to that question. I... <laughs> I professing to be wise, they became fools. Uh, that's, that's about, that's about it. Um, Absolutely. if there was a case study in, they have worshiped the creation rather than the creator, um, mm -hmm. you might find it right here. Absolutely. Um, and I'll just, I'll go ahead and maybe be a bit forward and, and rope in four and five, because these three all tie together. Um, four is the virgin birth understood as literal biology makes Christ's divinity as traditionally understood impossible. And number five, the miracle stories in the New Testament can no longer be interpreted in a post-Newtonian world as supernatural events performed by an incarnate deity. What has happened here is that, and if you're not tracking, well, I'll say this, it's extremely obvious what he's done here, and it's also a bit shrouded what he's done here. And here's what I mean. 
Spong has replaced God on the throne with himself specifically and humanity writ large. Now, that is obvious from the very first se sentence, which is theism as a way of defining God is dead and that, and that uh, Jesus is not the incarnate, you know, the incarnate nature of God. But three, four, and five are natural outflows of that. Spong has a God. It's just not the God of the Bible. That's right. And right. this atheistic nonsense, um, it, it, well, I, I'll just say it this way. The miracle stories of the New Testament can no longer be interpreted in, post -Newton in a post-Newtonian world as supernatural events. Stop. We have made Newton the ruler of God. That yes. is what has just happened here. We just flipped it just, just like that. It, it simply asserted Newton and, and in the previous one, Darwin, um, are superior to God. Um, no, absolutely. That, that is essentially what you see here. Yeah. And, and, and it almost falls into the category of scientism, which is yes. different than science, uh, the, the worship of science as a deity in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I want to, I'm going to do this quick, but I want to tell a okay. quick story because Go it's not, it. it's not about Spong. It's about Crossan, who was a contemporary of Spong. They, they both yeah. held very similar views about Jesus, about God. And if you don't know who, who John Dominic Crossan is, uh, he was part of the Jesus seminar, liberal theologian held many of the same positions and views as Spong. And I don't know what they did together. So I can't speak to that, but I know that they, they were contemporaries in time and, and, and of positions. And I remember one time hearing Crossan say that the, the feeding of the 5,000 was not a miracle mm -hmm. in the sense of Jesus did not create bread out of bread mm -hmm. and fish out of fish. But what he did was he encouraged those who had bread and fish to share with those who didn't. And what it was, was it was a great socialist miracle. It was the socialist of the, it was the idea of the haves sharing with the have nots. And Jesus convinced those who had brought food to share it with those who did not have food. And that's how 5,000 people were fed. Uh, and, 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 and you could hear people saying, oh, wow, how, what a miraculous, it's, it's, it's a true miracle of benevolence, Jesus getting the haves to share with the have nots. And that's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, according to John Dominic Cross. Now, again, I never heard Spong affirm that, but based mm -hmm. upon what he said about, uh, the miracles of the new Testament have to be reinterpreted. Mm -hmm. that's how it happens. That's an example mm -hmm. of how the miracles get reinterpreted. It's not a miracle mm -hmm. in the sense of Jesus never created anything out of anything. He simply right. encouraged people to share. And that's which, just, which is an astounding statement. If you take the whole counsel of God, let's, let's step out of just out of just that. Um, okay. Well, let me say this. Let's grant that premise for just a moment as absurd as it is. If we just go to Colossians 1, where you have the majesty of Christ as the one who created all things, you, you, you can say, and I don't hold this, by the way, you can say that the feeding of the 5,000 was simply an allegory. But if you take Colossians 1 and all of those uh, high lofty terms of Christ as being the one who created all things, any bread that's getting passed around was still created by Christ. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. It, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. I take the feeding of the 5,000 quite literally, but anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and, and I think a biblical, uh, uh, just a cursory biblical reading gives us that it's not, it doesn't mm -hmm. have the, it doesn't have the, uh, and, and, and the thing that Crossham would, would say in his teaching, cause I've heard him teach on this. He would say, it's a parable dummy. The whole thing is a parable. Jesus's whole life is a parable. And then that mm -hmm. was his, his favorite phrase. It's a parable dummy. You know, as mm -hmm. if to, like you know, it, you, you, like a, like a, uh, <laughs> Carvel, it's the economy stupid or something. Like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, number five just stuck out in my mind as, as yep. connecting to, to other teachers in the same vein. Uh, yep. number six, the view of the cross as the sacrifice for the sins of the world is a barbarian idea based on primitive concepts of God and must be dismissed. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I remember RC Sproul was preaching and a guy yelled at him as he was preaching on the atonement. And the guy yelled, that's primitive and obscene. Mm -hmm. And RC Sproul stopped and he said, you're right. The message of the mm -hmm. cross is primitive. It is obscene. It yep. is <clears throat> a scandal. It, it is. And, um, mm -hmm. but it's true. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 You, yeah. You know, this point, this, this one, and there's, um, um, 
there are two. So, so not everything that is false is entirely false. Sure. Um, and I completely affirm substitutionary atonement, penal substitutionary atonement, if we want to be ultra specific about it. But um, this is an idea. Number six is an idea that I think a larger number of people much closer to what I would call legitimate Christianity believe. Um, if you saw uh, Brian Zahn and um, Michael Brown debate this point, yes. Michael Brown went right into IHOP and and did a really good job defending a traditional view of the atonement. Um, but I would say, just if we're going to talk about things in categories, Brian Zahn is more of a Christian than John Shelby Spong was. That does not mean that Brian Zahn is... Uh, a full orthodox lowercase o believer and that he has all of his doctrines right, but he had a better idea than Spong did. Brian Zahn at least believed that there was a God who would, who would never do something so horrible as to sacrifice his son. Sure. He was at least that far along. Um, yeah. He, uh, yeah. Z Zahn would probably affirm. I don't know this cause I don't know his theology, but he would certainly affirm personal God, Probably yeah. the deity of Christ, all those things that, that you know, the, the the truthfulness of Scripture, all those things. Yeah. And, and I think he would. He made proofs from Scripture. He he, he yeah, basic, yeah. from Acts, and you know. And by the way, listener, if you're hearing this and you're interested, that is called the monster God debate. It's probably, mm -hmm. uh, even though I don't agree with michael brown on on much <laughs> and when it comes to <laughs> theology because he and i would, would disagree on a lot his 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 stand for the penal substitutionary atonement of christ in that debate was probably one of the best ones out mm -hmm. there uh especially yep. when it's having to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody who's challenging them uh he 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 really as as matthew mentioned earlier has a masterful uh, grasp on Hebrew, and he's able to go back mm -hmm. into Isaiah 53 and other passages and, and draw out yep. the the idea of penal substitution in the Old Covenant. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to listen to that if you haven't, the Monster God debate between Michael Brown and Brian Zahn. And if you're uh, concerned about having to send a, spend a whole afternoon, it's a relatively short debate. I believe when they cut it and produced it, it's only like an hour, hour 10, something like that. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. It, it is not an extremely long debate, so you can actually listen through it on a couple of car rides. Yeah. And, and um, like you said, Zahn would probably affirm portions mm -hmm. of, of number six, but he certainly would not affirm the idea that that uh, the sacrifice of Christ must be dismissed. Yes, I would completely he, he, agree. He would just reinterpret what the sacrifice did. Um, yes. But, but the idea that the, the, the thing that's, that, that really makes Spong's over and beyond is he saying the whole idea of sacrifice needs to be dismissed and, Correct. and, yeah. and that, and mm -hmm. that would be dangerous. Number yep. seven resurrection. This is interesting language. Resurrection is an action of God. Jesus was raised into the meaning of God. Yeah. Both of us. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> it therefore cannot be a physical resuscitation occurring inside human history. Uh, uh, let me translate that into very, <laughs> the very simple terms. Jesus did not rise from the dead. Yep. That's, that is his assertion. That, that's his assertion right there. And yep. uh, the, the apostle Paul says, if Christ did not raise, we are still in our sins. And uh, basically the, he affirmed right there that mm -hmm. Paul, that he disagrees with Pauline theology, that he disagrees with the necessity of the resurrection. I don't know what he did at Easter. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. but he certainly didn't celebrate a resurrection as we understand it. So, yeah. Uh, so the first five words or six words, resurrection is an action of God. Actually true. Yeah, sure. That yeah. is, that is the case uh, specifically in Christ's uh, physical body. And uh, eventually for all those who are in Christ on the last day. Yep. yep. That's true. But then now the Spong would affirm neither of those, but no, no, but the, but the next eight words, yeah. kill, kill it with fire. Uh, Jesus was Jesus. raised into the meaning of God. And dear listener, if you want to know what postmodernism is, it is staring you in the face with flashing warning lights. That's it. The, the, not even the modernist. A person who tells you Jesus was executed by the Romans, he was literally, actually, physically dead, and then three days later, he was no longer dead. His body was raised from the dead. That, as a summary of the resurrection, is fairly, I think, logically consistent. Jesus was raised into the meaning of God. If your first thought is, what does that even mean? Then you have, you have stepped on the postmodernist landmine. Welcome home. That is yeah. what it is. Yeah.
It cannot therefore be a physical <laughs> resuscitation, whatever. Yeah. Can't be. Yeah. All right. We got a few more. Uh, the next one is actually interesting because mm-hmm. he's, he's now, w- what do we always say? It's a death, burial and resurrection. And often we mention yeah. the ascension that Christ yep. ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the father. The next one uh, attacks the ascension. Uh, uh, number eight, it says the story of the ascension assumed a three tiered universe and is therefore mm-hmm. not capable of being translated into the concepts of a post Copernican. There we go. We've seen, we've seen Darwin. We <sighs> have seen uh, Newton. Now we see Copernicus being brought in. And, and uh, uh, the idea of uh, post Copernican space age, the idea is we know we live on a round ball that's surrounded by an atmosphere that's surrounded by empty space. That's, uh, you know, filled with other celestial uh, bodies. And he would say, so Jesus didn't ascend because where would he have ascended to space? That doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. We know better than the Bible writers. They believed in a three-tiered universe, and, and we know that that's not the case. And, and again, he's, he's assuming a lot about what they understood, and, yes. he's, and he's assuming that uh, Jesus's ascension was determined by the, the limitations of our space and, and globe. Right. And, Right. The Bible says Christ ascended into heaven. Um, I'm sure at some point he simply went out of sight or went out of view. And at that right. point he's with the father. It's not as if, you know, I, and this is where I'm going to get a little weird and you, you stop me if you think I'm being too weird. I, I tend okay. to, th- I, I tend to think of heaven sort of dimensionally versus um, in the sense of um when we think of like up and down, you know, people think you rise up into heaven uh, or you, um, and then you think the world's round. Okay. Well now you're going out to get to heaven. And there have been some astronauts who've gone out into the, into space and said, well, I went to space and God wasn't there. Well, of course, but you're not in the realm of God. You've, you've simply gone into the realm of space and that's not where God is in the sense of God is in a dimension that we cannot see or understand in it, right now. And we've seen pictures in scripture where there were, um, where people had their eyes open to see into the spiritual dimension where, 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 you know, they were able to see, uh, the, the, the angels and see things. I, Isaiah chapter six, for instance. Yeah. Where the, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, um, where, when Christ ascended into heaven, it wasn't as if he's going higher, 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 you know, like ascending a ladder to the top. Mm. He's going to a different, dim- and when I say dimension, I, I don't want to seem like multiverse dimensional type. No, pop. you could say yeah. a realm. That would be he's, fine. He's a different realm. Thank you. That, that's a better term. Mm. He's moving to a different realm of being at that point, a realm of, you know, of, of where he is. And uh, his ascending into heaven, I do think, uh, was... The purpose for that, the purpose, the reason why he didn't just disappear was because there's a, there's a picture of God being above God being, yes. you know, the idea of below Sheol and that which is below yep. is, 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 um, is, is apart from God. And that which is above is, is, is close to God. And in the sense of the way we think, you know, we look yeah, up to heaven, sure. we look down to the earth. And so Christ didn't simply disappear. He ascended and, and, and right. in a way gave us a visual visualization of his, uh, of, of where he was going, what he was doing. So, Certainly. um, so the idea, I mean, well, go ahead. Well, so spatially spatial references are used all over scripture to help us understand that point in Ephesians. Um, I believe in Ephesians chapter two, it says that God has seated us in the heavenly places. Um, we are still here on this earth. We are still walking around. However, that has an eternal truth to it, that those who are in Christ, God being outside of time has already seated us in the heavenly places. Yep. Um, in Ephesians yep. chapter six, you have the the, uh, the the spiritual warfare verse in verse 12, where it says that we wrestle, we're wrestling against rulers and powers and authorities, and he names all these in the heavenly realms or in the spiritual realms. Yep. And all the way back to the very first sentence in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is a separation made. Um, understanding ancient cosmology, I, I just have this weird idea that maybe the biblical writers had it right and we don't always. Um, all we have done, Copernicus, and Newton and John Shelby Spong is we have further explored what is meant by the earth and the earth as a concept is our realm of existence. Yeah. And so say someday we stick a base on, on, on um, Pluto. We are still in what the biblical writers would refer to as the earth. Um, we have not ascended to God's realm and we have not descended into the realm below. So uh, that's, I have no problem talking in ancient cosmology. I think those categories are still very relevant today. 
And, um, but Spong just throws it out because that's just what he did. Sure. There's a funny picture the economist had, um, speaking of this, how a lot of Christians see the Ascension or what it was about the nation of Brazil and the famous statue of Cristo Redender, you know, Christ the Redeemer there in, in Rio, um, taking off like a rocket ship over the, <laughs> the, it's about Brazil's economy takes off, but I've used it and I'll send it to you now in chat. You can look at it and laugh, but, uh, and maybe put it up on the screen. Maybe not. I don't know, but it's just funny because it's how a lot of Christians, I think, visualize the ascension <laughs> happening. <laughs> Jesus with rocket motors in his feet, yes. just flying off into space. That, you know, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to try to try to squeeze that in there uh, in post. Yeah. Um, well, the last few, and just because of time, and I know we've kind of uh, sure. we've, we've we've been uh, opining a lot on these different ones. Uh, I, I I'm going to read through them, and and if yeah. you want to stop me and say a few things, but just listener, as you hear these, hear what is being attacked, and and I'll give it away. Number nine, he's attacking scripture. Number ten, he's attacking the personal relationship that we can have with God through prayer. Uh, number 10, he's, he's, he's essentially attacking life after death. And, uh, but then in number, uh, 12, he's sort of attacking what he would consider the injustices of the church, which is not necessarily wrong, but his answer to it is certainly not right. So the number nine is there's no external objective revealed standard written in scripture or on tablets of stone that will govern our ethical behavior for all time. So no Bible. No, the scripture is yep. not, we, we can't trust the Bible. Number 10. From an epistemological standpoint, that should really be point one. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, that, that explains all the other ones. Yep, absolutely. It doesn't believe the Bible. Yep. Number 10, prayer cannot be a request made to a theistic deity to act in human history in any, in a particular way. So he's saying, God, you know, you can't really ask God to intervene. He's not going to. And that's that. Mm -hmm. Uh the hope, number 11, the hope for life after death must be separated forever from the behavior control mentality of reward and punishment. The church must abandon, therefore, its reliance on guilt as a motivator of behavior. Um, boy, we could spend a whole hour on that. Uh, you know, what, oh, do we, yes. what do we understand as far as um, how does guilt operate? And, and um, certainly there are those who impose, um, mistreatment on people through the use of guilt and a misunderstanding of, of grace and works. Uh, you know, so as you said earlier, there may be a little truth in some of these, but mm -hmm. it's so, it's so shrouded in the lie that it's hard to mm -hmm. say, you know, well, well, there's some truth to this because it's all coming from a, a wrong worldview. Right. You know, right. And then um, number 12, all human beings bear God's image and must be respected for what each person is. And this one, and you may want to say something about this, but mm -hmm. I'll say it. The uh, the to even say all all human beings bear God's image, but you've already said you don't believe in a personal God. So what does that yeah. even mean? Meaningless. And we're and you and I, if we're defending the doctrine of the Imago Dei, if we're defending the idea of the value of human life, which is central to our our views on abortion or things like that, we would go to Scripture. We yep. would say this is what God has said, and in what Jesus said when he was in encountering the Pharisees and he says, have you not read what God spoke to you saying? And then he points at, I think Isaiah. So we would do the same thing that Jesus did. And we would define human beings as being extremely valuable in God's sight because they're made in the image of God. But Spong does not have a scripture to do that from. And at this point, he does not have a God to do that with. And he does not have a, a, uh, a formed view of life after death as point 11 said. So who cares if you mistreat an image bearer of God? What, That's right. So what the atonement wasn't real either. So, so what? Yep. And he goes on to say, therefore, no external description of one's being, whether based on race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation can properly be used as the basis for either rejection or discrimination. Now, we would both uh, likely affirm a very similar understanding of that it is wrong to discriminate mm -hmm. in the sense of mistreating people. Yes. At the same time, we do understand that there are, you know, we make distinctions because the, the, the distinct uh, discrimination in one sense is just the making of distinctions. And yep. that does happen. Um, but notice what, and this is, this happens always when you talk to liberals uh, and, and I hate to put liberals like in a, 
homogenous clump because they're not. Sure. But when you speak to liberal people in general, they tend to uh, to connect race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation as If all of those are immutable facts about someone, somebody's race is certainly an immutable fact, even though people now are trying to be transracial people who are trying to change their race. Mm. But, but, but yeah, (laughs) but the idea of uh, race is, is an immutable, you know, I'm a white guy, you're a white guy, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, that that's, that's something that's not going to change. It's, it's an unchangeable part of who we are, our ethnicity also. Uh, we can't go back and change who our parents or grandparents were, where we grew up, our gender, even though, again, the whole idea <laughs> of transgenderism is 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 up for discussion right now. But uh, we would say it's an immutable part of who we are. Mm-hmm. But sexual orientation uh, is put into that same category as this is just the way they were made. They were made in God's image and they were made this way. They were made to be right. uh, homosexuals. And that what's interesting is, and this again could take us into a longer conversation. There are some in the, the homosexual advocacy, I hate to call it a community, but those who advocate for homosexuals, uh, who, who don't like the idea of saying that homosexuality is an immutable part of someone because they say at that point, they lose some of their human freedom and will. Mm -hmm. They they say, no, this is who I am because this is who I choose to be. And I should be celebrated for who I choose to be. Uh, And so there's, there's almost a disagreement within the community of those who would say, no, my, my sexuality is an immutable part of who I am versus someone who would say, no, I chose this. And this is right because I get to choose whoever I want to be. I can choose to be, again, I could choose to be a, 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 a seven foot tall black man, you know, because yeah, that's exactly that's, that's who I choose to be. So uh, that, that again, could take us mm-hmm. to a wild subject, but the idea here is sure. he's saying none of these things can be used for any discrimination. And you know why? Because he would say that the church has been wrong for 2000 years in saying yeah. that homosexuality is a sin mm-hmm. and something that people need to repent of. What's very interesting to me on this is that the abolitionist movement against slavery was primarily zealous Christians. Um, the, uh, the people who were asserting that we should not have legalized discrimination in the United States, um, were primarily Christians. Now I'm not, that's not to say there weren't Christians on the other side, twisting the Bible to, to do what they, you know, but, but that's the case. Everyone was appealing to a standard, but again, Spong has thrown out the standard. So why shouldn't I discriminate based on race? Who cares? No. Um, Jeff Durbin said in a debate he did with some atheists, if all you are is, and I love this phrase, a bag of fizzing atoms in a universe that doesn't care, then why does it so matter? What? Yeah. Why does it matter at all? And so what I would say here is, first off, yes, if we're going to use scripture as our standard, which Spong will not do, but I will, um, Colossians 3 does tell us there is no Jew nor Greek, there is no slave nor free, there is no this nor this, and he he lays out all of these diametrically opposed categories to say that we are all in Christ. That's not to say those distinctions don't exist, but he's saying before the throne of God and at the altar and at the table, um, none of those are, are, uh, are, are hindrances. But for sexual orientation, like you said, the category confusion is very interesting because um, the Bible does speak specifically against that very clearly, uh, against aberrant sexual orientations. Um, the two that God has created, of course, live those out. They're good and, and wonderful things, but um, and and stay with the one you were created to be. But um, in that case, uh, you have a conflation of those things. And to the person who says, even maybe to the listener of this, I don't know, who says, well, I was just born this way. I'm actually not going to argue with you on that. The thing is, Jesus says we have to be born again. Amen. And so- it, it is very possible that, yes, you were born with that particular sin afflicting you. I Listen, it, whether it's greed or gluttony or pornography or any of these sins, yes, absolutely. Sin has cursed all of creation. And maybe the sin that you have is, a, is an aberrant sexual uh, desire or orientation, something like that. Christ offers the ability to be born again and to be drawn out of that. And that is the good news of the gospel. And in fact, what is referred to by the LGBT advocates as a clobber passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. The very next verse says, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, 
and you were redeemed by this God who can do that. And so we do not have a negative view of those uh, who, who would espouse an LGBT identity in the sense that we think they're forever cut off and irredeemable and all that. No, the grace of the cross is there, but Amen. you need the grace of the cross. That's right. And that's the difference. And I think that's a good place to draw to a close. The difference yes. between our position and, and Spong's position on this issue is he would say, as a homosexual, you're good the way you are, stay the way you are, this is the way you are, and there's no need to repent. We would say God has offered through the cross a way of redemption and salvation, which comes through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. And that and that's and and, and Spong would disagree with everything I just said. And therefore, um, as we draw this to a close, that's the key to all of this. This man for 31 years, according to the Wikipedia page, 79 to the year 2000, he stood uh, among 40,000 Episcopalians as a voice of teaching, as a voice of wisdom, according to their authority. And, and, and he was a man who was denying scripture. He was denying God. He was denying Christ. And let me tell you something. He's not alone. There right. are many of many men uh, and women who take the same positions as Spong, who continue to stand behind pulpits and churches in the world, and we need to be mindful uh, of of men and women like this and be willing to mm -hmm. refuse <clears throat> to listen and refuse to take what they are handing out and be willing to challenge it when mm -hmm. the the opportunities arise. As I was telling. Matthew earlier, I'm about to begin teaching in second John and our, uh, which is a one, you know, one page book of the Bible. Yeah. But, uh, but the focus, uh, you know, in it, at least a portion of the focus of that small book is, is how we are to receive those who are false teachers. And it's, and, and, and John says, we don't even give them a greeting. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean that we're not kind, uh, but we do not, we do not welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ, but we mark them out as ones who are dangerous. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the, that is really what we have intended to do here today for you. The listener is to say, here's a man he's passed on. So this gave us certainly a, a reason to reference him because he has passed on, but his books, tapes, videos, and YouTube, uh, videos are, are they're not going away anytime soon. In fact, mm -hmm. with his death, those things may see a spike in popularity and you may see something come across your Facebook uh, newsfeed and, and you need to know who this man is. So you know how to mark out and look out for somebody who teaches like mm -hmm. this. I'm going to give you one last word. If you have anything, Matthew, sure. and I'm going to draw to a close. Absolutely. Um, to the listener, I would say carrying that balance of being grateful that a person who would deceive many is now no longer deceiving the brethren um, but also mourning the loss of a sinner who, as, as far as we can tell, uh, died apart from God's grace. Um, just sort of keep that in mind as you, as you go about, you know, thinking about how to, um, how to interact with this. And something, and I will, I will assert this is truth, um, something a friend of mine told me when we were discussing this a couple of days ago. John Shelby Spong, when he was alive on this earth, did not believe in a personal God. But John Shelby Spong now does. That's and right. uh, a God who is just and righteous and holy and merciful, but also who judges. And, um, and all of us one day stand before that very same God, and he will be just. And so if that causes you um, concern, then, then get in touch with Keith or get in touch with me, I guess. Uh, yeah. Cling to the cross of Jesus, and he will, uh, he will be your Savior and a perfect one for all who cry out to him. Amen. I was one time doing a funeral for a man. And while I was doing the funeral, one of his friends got up and went and shouted at the funeral director. He mm -hmm. said, this man did not believe the things that that preacher is saying. He needs to be quiet. Well, by God's grace, the, the funeral director didn't stop me. I got to finish my mm -hmm. sermon. But as, mm -hmm. as I finished, I walked out and I came face to face with the funeral director. And he says, you know, there was a man who said that you should stop preaching because the guy in the casket did not believe what you were saying. And I looked at the funeral director and I said, well, he does now. Yeah, that's the fact. He does now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, friends, listeners, thank you for being with us today on Conversations with the Calvinist. Matthew, thank you for being with us again, as always. I appreciate Happy you being here. Happy to do here. it. And uh, I hope that this has been enlightening and encouraging for you. And again, if you have any questions, you can reach us at calvinistpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Conversation with the Calvinist. My name is Keith Foskey, and I've been your Calvinist. May God bless you. Thank you for listening to Conversations with the Calvinist. If you enjoyed the program, please take a moment to subscribe. And if you have a question you would like us to discuss on our future program, please email us at calvinistpodcast at gmail.com. As you go about your day, remember this. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. All who come to him in repentance and faith will find him to be a perfect Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. May God be with you.